Good morning, guys. So I'm a little later than my usual live stream this morning. And um, I wanted to talk about when you're preparing and when you're trying to when you're trying to make sure that you have enough enough of a range of things in your home and enough depth in the things that you're you have in your home to take care of your family that if there was an interruption of service like with trucks or with grocery stores or anything like that that you would be taken care of until help arrived or until things were fixed to my mind that's what preparation is about is giving yourself a buffer of health and food and happiness and stress-free existence until solutions are found. That's what I think of when I think of preparation. So, um, so first I'll talk about my preparation and also my anxiety level about what's happening in the world right now. Um, <clears throat> so currently we have milk goats, pigs, rabbits, ducks, chickens, geese, sheep. I think I got everything. Um, I have freezers full of meat and no room to put any more meat. I'm currently making goat cheese even as we speak. Uh, we have eggs from the ducks and the chickens. We have multiple gardens all over the property and we have fruit trees that will be coming on soon. Hey, Palmetto, how are you? I think it's possible to be too prepared. So that's why the reason I want to talk about this is um, because of my anxiety level right now, uh, our our climate has been very cold this year. Yesterday we were in, um, it was cold. If you had a hat and a jacket on, you were still a little chilly. So the highest that we've been some days have been in the 50s. The highest we've been in some days have been the 60s. We've had a few days, one day that was 90 degrees. We've had maybe a handful of days that have been in the 80s, and we're in the middle of June. So, um, <laughs> Paul says, I'm old and tired. Um, yeah, I feel, I okay, so that's why I want to talk about this today. I think that you get to a point where you're prepping, and you're just wearing yourself out. And um, I think the more deliberate we are in our preps, the more... We stop and take a deep breath and analyze and say, okay, so I'm anxious about this thing. I'm really anxious about this thing. But is that the thing that could prepare me the best for the widest range of things that that are a true possibility in my area? Do you know what I, do you know what I mean by that? I I think, you know, the odds of us having um, certain disasters here are very low, whereas having certain disasters, other other disasters here are you know, average. They're not high, but they're, you know, kind of average. Amy said, yes, it's a cold spring here too in Western Washington. That is a very timely topic. So <clears throat> yes, I'll go back to uh, what it is that we've prepared for. Uh, right now I have a year's worth of grain in my garage and I have hay that I have pre-ordered. It isn't cut, it isn't baled, it isn't stacked yet but it's pre-ordered. And the reason it's pre-ordered is because of our strange cold summer this year. And I'm, I'm looking at all these preps and I'm seeing the turmoil in my stomach as I, I'm, I'm, I'm the most um, boots on the ground, continual turnover of food storage person that I know. I don't know anybody who raises such a broad range of their own food. And yet, here I am with this turmoil in my stomach about how could I have more? How could I make sure that I'm more carefully prepared so that if I needed to help people, I would have the resources to do that. And um, I'm also going through a course right now. It's a codependency course. Um, there's some addiction in my family. And I am built to take care of people and then to feel resentment or to feel anxious or to feel like there's not enough, enough, whatever enough means. And so in our preparations, I think it's really important to stop 
and make lists and really analyze how much we actually need. Can we take care of the world around us? To the best of our abilities, yes. We, we can really try to reach out and help other people. But in doing that and also in taking care of our family, are we actually prepping harder than we need to? Things go bad. If, you, if I buy too much hay, I can use it in other places. Like I can use it for mulch if it really went bad. But the thing is, is that there's other things I could be doing with my life that are happy things with that money rather than buying way more hay than I need. And that's where I am right now is that um, we have an extra boar. We have our, our pigs that are fantastic that we're not buying commercial feed for. What do you need, honey? Um, I think it's in the car. Pretty sure it's in the van. Um, I have an extra boar because I just keep thinking, oh my gosh, these are these are pigs that could save people's lives. They're they're so great. We don't have to buy commercial feed for them. They can live on hay and milk and food scraps and that kind of thing. But then I have to take a step back and say, but do I need an extra boar? Do I need an extra boar? Maybe I do. Maybe I need to sit down and crunch the numbers and say, how much pork do we really want to eat? Can we really eat that much pork? Because if we can't and the pigs are um, not making us a whole bunch of money, then maybe an extra boar is not what I need. Um, Paul Meadows said we've had at least three weeks so far this spring, summer, which every day was 100 degrees. Wow. So we're the, we're the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> We're very close to Yellowstone, and so if you guys have seen on the news the flooding in Yellowstone, it's very interesting because we've had a drought-ish spring, and, and we've been getting our, our moisture here in the summer, um, whereas they got just completely hammered and flooded, but we're very close to them. Zelda said, our biggest fears are having a bunch of crazies heading east, wandering over from downtown Portland to do what they did two years ago when they came by buses. The small town mayor of S. Estacada told them. Interesting. Well, and, and there is that kind of thing. We live, um, we live in the country, but most of the people moving to the country right now don't even have gardens. When I, when I'm out and about and I'm driving, or if I'm on a little walk and I walk past somebody who has a garden, I literally start to weep. I know it sounds crazy, but I literally start to weep when I see somebody who has planted a garden that's big enough to feed their family because um, of that very thing is that even though I live in the country and I used to be surrounded by farmer's fields, I am now surrounded by subdivisions. And a lot of those people don't even have a wood stove, which to me is absolutely blow my mind crazy. If you live in a place where the winters get down to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit and you have electricity or you have a propane stove that has an electric fan or an electric starter. Um, you are you have put your family in grave danger not to have some source of non-electric heat if you live in an area like mine. And yet I know a handful of people that have a real electric stove. I know some people who think they're very preparedness minded and they have a pellet stove, which has a feeder and needs to be plugged in, <laughs> you know, it, and so um, gasoline only runs so far on a generator, solar panels, unless you have incredibly efficient appliances, solar panels are not good. I grew up with solar panels. I was like 13 when my family got solar panels and we had the battery bank and everything. And you had to be very, very choosy about what you could run at any time. And a heater does not run on solar panels for very long. It, it, it just doesn't have the push to heat with electricity if you're using solar panels. So the people who are wanting so badly to have every tiny little amenity and easy thing in their preparedness and expecting to run it on solar panels or on a generator, whoo, it gives me the shivers because I know how much wood we go through on our wood stove in a year to keep if, if the electricity goes out and we don't have a fan we just have a normal box fan set on the side of the stove if we don't have that box fan on and we just have our little uh sterling engine uh fan on the stove we sleep in the kitchen because of how cold it gets it keeps the pipes from freezing downstairs because it's 40 degrees downstairs 
if we have the, the wood stove going. But without electricity to run that fan, we live in the kitchen. And that's with a really nice wood stove and lots of wood outside. And it heats our water and it cooks our food and it keeps us warm. <laughs> I mean, it does everything for us. And so I think I, that's why I think that some people are prepping too hard in some areas and not looking at like the breadth of what they could be prepping. And that way, instead of spending a huge amount of money over here on this thing that maybe isn't as important, maybe you should be looking at, at your breadth of, of preparedness, especially if you're living in a new area. Go to the old folks and find out what is it that you need to be most prepared for in our area. It could be heat. You might need to be putting a um, a porch on part of your house and screening it in with mosquito screening so that if your electricity went out and you did not have air conditioning, you could get a breeze flowing through your house and you could go out on the porch to sleep at night but not get eaten alive by mosquitoes. I mean, when we were down south, that was a real thing was being able to have air conditioning. And if you couldn't get air conditioning, you needed to look at the way the old houses were built when they didn't have air conditioning and see these massive porches with their mosquito um, uh, screening on all sides so that they could cool down. Um, let's see. Good morning from northern Idaho. Hello, Forrest. Zelda said they were not welcome here to set fire right and destroy our small town. They arrived days later, but were met with old timers with long guns. It was daily firestorms. Terrifying. See, and that and and that's a real thing here in our area. What has been happening is that we've had more crime coming in. We are surrounded by people coming in from Washington, from Oregon, from California. And that's pretty much been it. The three states have been Oregon, Washington, and California. People trying to get away from the crazy. Take her, take her back out. Hang on. Did you know where the buzzer is? It was in the in the van. Okay. Thanks, Annie. Um, or she can stay in. That's fine. Just shut the door, okay? Um, and so, with those three gr groups of people, I think they're running away from a lot, and a, maybe kids, their children have been used to living in those places where theft is normal or, or property damage is normal. And that's what we're dealing with here in our area. So, okay, so there's some good preps we're working on. We have dogs to alert us if there's people on our property. I've already been working on a, on a thorny hedge around our property for the whole time that we've been here. And it's filling in pretty nicely. But... Um, we are we are working on on that kind of preparation because that is a bit of a hole is that as more crime comes in um i want to make sure that uh we're not leaving ourselves open to predation um let's see american eden said good morning village setter said good morning palmetto said solar technology has improved a lot over the years but it's still not going to heat your house exactly uh solar has changed it's still not a good main source of energy because it's delicate it's delicate and the batteries are incredibly expensive and you have to replace them frequently you know every i think it's a 10 years you have to replace is it 10 years or is it five years i'm trying to remember five or ten years you have to replace your battery bank um and when we were on solar my dad had to check and make sure our charge was high enough in order to run certain things all of our appliances were expensive because they had to be very very low consumption and at the same time, we couldn't run the washer or dryer off of the solar. We could run the well pump. We could run, um, what else did we run off? <laughs> we didn't run much, maybe the lights. Um, we had a propane fridge. We had propane wood or a propane cook stove. We had propane heaters. And then as backup, we had um, the wood stove if, if we needed it in a really cold year. And then my dad had a 500-gallon 500, 500 dairy tank, a stainless steel dairy tank that was our water reservoir for holding water if the power and the solar panels went out. So we always would have water. Um, let's see. Amy said, I grew up with mom using wood cook stove. Double benefits of food and heat. Yes. And also sterilizing of water. And heating up a bath water, that kind of thing. One thing that I would recommend for everybody in a cold climate is a wood stove. And for anybody in any climate is a hand pump. Make sure you have a pump on your well that without electricity, you can get water. 
It, it buys you so much time to have drinking water. Uh, bath water, laundry water, not so much. You don't, not essential. Who knew? Not essential to have bathing water or laundry water or things like that. But drinking water is essential for you and your animals. And so for anybody that I know uh, that has a pump, that has like a, uh, their own well, get a hand pump on your well. And for those of you who are in a little community um, with a community well, do a poll, get everybody to chip some money in and get a hand pump on your well. Because it will, it, in, in times of difficulty, it saves lives and peace of mind, saves lives and, and minds. Um, let's see. Nidaveller, Forge, and Woodcraft said, just study how people prepped and lived before electricity. Most people get overloaded with the knowledge that will be needed. Well, and that's, um, we lived off grid in our little uh, shed for three years. And I grew up off grid when I was um, 12 and 13. My parents didn't have power. Uh, we used a wood stove and we used an outhouse, etc. <clears throat> and uh, I was the one that had to drive the car. That's how I learned how to drive was I would take the five gallon uh, buckets and I would go to the neighbors and fill them up with water and bring them back. And that's how we lived. And um, it wasn't a big deal it because really you have very few essentials when it comes down. You need somewhere to eliminate your waste, which is the outhouse. You need clean water. You need a source of heat and shelter. Shelter. Those are what you need. And um, as long as you have a source nearby for all of them, you will be okay. And practice. It pretend, a lot of times, it, the best way to, to say is pretend you're going camping. And if you have enough to survive going camping in the winter, you'd be fine. Pretend you're camping in your house. Do I have a source of heat? Do I have a source of water? Um, one problem we have in this area is if you don't have a source of heat in your house, your pipes will freeze. I had a friend that when we had a deep freeze and power lines went down a few years ago, all of her storage water froze. And she she stored her uh, her storage water out in her garage and all of her water froze. And they didn't have a wood stove in the house. They didn't have propane in the house. And so they had no way to get water. And um, so what they were doing is going to the, I think they were going to the grocery store or something and buying Kool-Aid or, or something and bringing it home. So they had to leave the house to get food and water because of the way that they had prepped was that they did not account for heat and they did not account for a new source of water. Um, <clears throat> so they lived in snowsuits for a few days and they went to friends' homes that did not have a power out. And uh, I think that's a pretty scary way to keep things going because what if the roads were blocked? What if she couldn't get out on the roads to go to a friend's house to warm up? Then she'd be in real trouble. All right. Um, okay. Zelda said running a generator alerts the bad guys for miles around that there's people with food and supplies. Very true. But also a wood stove does exactly the same thing. Uh, if you've got wood coming out of or snow, ugh, if you got smoke coming out of your chimney, it's a, an alert to everybody that here there is warmth. Um, so what we would probably do in that kind of situation is we'd go out to our cabin that we fully furnished to be off grid and it has a rocket stove, which does not have smoke. And, um, it doesn't smell like wood when you burn it. It smells a little bit like metal because the chimney gets really warm. But it it has a little tiny bit of steam that comes out, but that's it. And we have it built back next to the canal a little bit. But that's probably what we would do. If it was in a grid down situation and we were that concerned, we would probably, um, I don't know what we would do <laughs> because... Um, I would want to keep my pipes from freezing in my house. So I'd want to have a, a, a fire going in here. But um, if it was that scary, we'd probably maybe bring the rocket stove in here or do something like that. Cause it doesn't, it doesn't have exhaust the same way a regular uh, fire chimney does. Hideaway Homestead said hello from Maine. Paul Matter paratrooper you said you can also open a window on one side of the house and a door on the opposite side to create a draft through the house. Yes, you totally can. Um, Jeanette Chambers said, good morning from North Alabama. Good morning. Uh, Jeanette said, I was in Southern California. Oh, I'm losing things. But I was a teacher and conservative. Don't worry. There are a lot of conservative people in California. There are. And a lot of them are coming here. I've met some amazing people 
that have come from Washington and Oregon and California. And they're coming here, I think, because they want to live here and protect what we already have. But I'm not certain that that that's everybody. Just because of we never like the doors on the grocery store used to be wide open and there would never be a guard there. Now there's a guard there because people come in, fill up their groceries, and then they just walk out. Which is, oh my gosh, is that a thing? We don't lock our doors here. And yet there have been trucks that have been stolen from farms. Um, there has been uh, a lot of theft, which is unfortunate. Um, Sherm Dog said, my well is 600 feet. Hand pups don't work. There are some that will go that deep, but they're very expensive. The, um, if you look at, at Layman's catalog, they have some that go very deep. I'm not sure how easy they are to pump. But yeah, if I was you and, and you were 600 feet deep and you were in a warmer area, um, let's see, what is the name of their channel? Off Grid with Doug and Stacy. They do a, what is it called? Um, they have a cistern is what they do. And that way they have a pressurized source of water that's always getting clean because the water runs into the cistern and then runs into the house. And that's what they do. We couldn't do it here because everything would freeze solid. Everything has to stay eight feet down in order to not freeze here. But um, we have a shallow well. Uh, we may not have a deep enough well in time as more people are moving in and uh, the aquifer drops a little bit. But up to, I think this one can go up to 300 feet. Our hand pump can go up to 300 feet. Jeanette Chambers said, and Oregon, I used to live there. The big cities seem to have all the power and the rural people are at the mercy of the large cities like Portland and LA. Uh, it can seem like that, huh? For us, it's Boise. A lot of, you know, that's our capital is Boise. And um, a lot of interesting things happening there that would not be considered uh, people or freedom friendly. So, yep, I hear you. Camp Patton Family Compens said, we are working on buying well water rights for both properties. Do you have to buy your well water rights up there? Uh, for us here, a big thing is surface water. We have to buy, well, you inherit water rights generally with your property. But if they were sold off, you can then at certain times of the year purchase irrigation rights. And... Um, that's actually where a lot of the recharge for our well comes from is from the canal that's right on the edge of our property. Um, Sodbuster said, I'm from California too. Moved to Indiana because I wanted to protect my family from crazy politics, but our small town was a big conservative community. But most people lump us with the big city. Interesting, interesting. Um, yeah, so Sherm Dodd said that he has backups for his water even since his well is so deep. <laughs> Uncle Squirrel said, I personally blame squirrels. We don't have a lot of squirrels here. Uh, we have been eating a lot of uh, groundhog or rock chuck here. We have some very uh, cute little rock chucks that are in our pallet pile. And usually we leave them alone and they do their own thing. But this year they have bred like crazy. And so we are getting fat on rock chuck. This has been Paige's first year of hunting for herself and uh, using her little 1022 to provide food for the family. She is the one, she and Kaya both uh, dispatched a buck last week, a goat buck and butchered them. And then we have the rock chucks that we've been doing as well, which has been kind of fun. Oregon farm girl said, oh, it keeps popping down too far. Okay, Oregon Farm Girl said my well is 760 feet down. Don't think a hand pump would work. Then, again, if you're in a warm enough area, maybe get a cistern. Is that what the word is? Cistern? I think that's the word. Um, as long as you don't get too cold, they won't freeze. Um, and if they're big enough, that is also helpful. But otherwise, I don't know. Store a lot of water. Because if you have livestock, too. It's not just you drinking the water, it's your livestock. For us, a lot, we would be hand pumping all day long in a, in a water out situation, in a grid down situation, because we have to, we'd have to pull water for the goats, we'd have to pull water for the pigs, we'd have to pull water for the ducks and for the geese and for the sheep and then for our own use. We would not be doing any laundry. Um, I like that. Palmetto Paratrooper, we go camping for eight days every year for tabernacles. I like that. I think it's really, really wise to do some really intensive camping 
throughout the year without an RV with, you know, and, and without special toys, but just to remember, okay, this is how this works and this is what we need and this is what we're missing. And it's great to have the toil, the, it's great to have the toys, the specialized toys for camping, but I think it's wiser to see how, how much wood do I really need if I'm cooking on a grill outside and I need um, to get the coals down to the right uh, state and I'm cooking with a Dutch oven. How would I do this? Do I remember that I'm not doing it when the fire is necessarily alive for certain foods? Do I need to wait for coals? These are all things that are really good to experiment with. Also, you don't have to have a fancy wood cook stove. You can use a regular wood stove and just use your Dutch oven to cook in it. You can bake bread in it. You can break, you can bake bread on the top of your stove if you've got a good Dutch oven. And so just experiment with that kind of thing. If you don't have, again, if you don't have a fancy wood stove, you don't need a fancy wood stove. You just need a wood stove or a fire pit. If you're, if your weather doesn't get that cold and you don't have a lot of snow and you would be cooking meals outside have a fire pit, but know how to use your tools. No, do you need a spider? Do you need um, a Dutch oven? Do you need some cooling racks? What What is it that you need? Do you need to build something of a shelter around it so that if you have a lot of rain all, all year round, do you maybe need to build a shelter over the top of your cooking area that is your outside cooking area? Do you need to vent it better so that you're not smoking yourself out while you're doing that? All of these things are not expensive. A Dutch oven is not expensive. Um, getting a few uh, posts in the ground and putting up some tin over your outdoor cooking area is not expensive. Um, let's see. Sherm Dog said the bad guys might end up being your neighbors, so make sure or hope they also prep. And one of the ways I look at that is just like, you know, if, if things really got that bad, my preps hopefully will bless somebody else. I can't take them with me. I I will do my best. I will do my best to be prepared. But in the end, you have to let go of your stuff. Sometimes with the best of preps, you have to leave it. In which case, make sure you have bug out bags. One, one prep that I wish that I had is I wish I had a horse trailer that I could just load up with some bins that had um, pre-made food for my animals so that if we had to leave, like, like during the Teton Dam flood, um, if you don't have everything ready, then if you need to evacuate quickly, you wouldn't be able to take your animals with you. Um, they wouldn't have anything to eat while you were gone anyway. And so for me, because all my animals are small and they would fit in a horse trailer, I would love to have a horse trailer and just store some hay in it and, and put like 20 gallons worth of water in it and some, some other things that would, uh, some grain. And that way, if push came to shove and we suddenly had to leave, but we had five minutes, that's what I would grab. I would grab my animals and I would put them in the trailer and I would take them with me. And because I'd already had the horse trailer prepped, I could do that. Um, there's very little that I would grab out of my house. Very little. Um, yeah, I would grab my kids. I would probably grab a safety deposit box. But if I already had my horse trailer loaded with water and food for my family, essentials for maybe a week and if I had essentials for a month for my animals in there all I would have to do I already have all my animals trained to come to me and so instead of having to go out and wrangle animals all we would do is just lead everybody and even the pigs are trained to come um and so it would be probably the only animals that I couldn't do that with is the chickens the chickens would not come uh because they're chickens uh but I could train them to do that that would be a good prep um, let's see. Jeanette Chambers said, Sodbuster Living. I think they're a lot more conservatives than liberals in most areas. The liberals are just louder. Funny. Um, Zelda said, we're early 70s and have suffered serious health issues. So worry equals running out of medication. Can't live without. That is another thing that is very important. I try very hard. Um, I like to be on a monthly ship shipping, uh, shipment from certain companies that are things like medicine or vitamins that I can't live without. For me, it's vitamin D. I can't really live without my vitamin D. Um, I'm very fair skinned, so I have a, a hard time being out in the sun as much as I would need to be to get enough vitamin D. Lysine, also, if you guys have seen, like that sometimes, I don't have them now, but 
if I eat rice or too much corn, I get, I get blisters on my lips and the lysine fixes that. So I just have certain things I need to keep on hand and I like to have that on a monthly uh, renewal thing. Um, Camp Pat and Family Compound said propane is our backup heat source. Our primary is the wood stove. Electric heat is our backup to the backup. And that's how we are too. We have electric heat in our house, but we don't use it unless we need to turn the heat on in the middle of summer and we don't have the chimney cleaned. If we have the chimney cleaned, we'll still just turn on the wood stove. But uh, my chimney cleaner broke the last time I tried to use it and I need to get a new one. Um, Let's see, American Eden said, oh, they're talking to Zelda. Zelda said, we opened our home up to older people suffering too cold, unprepped, we shared the warmth. And I think that's very important. I have friends that I don't understand why, when they didn't have preparedness, why they didn't just come to our house. But here's the thing. I think this is why people don't come to your house when they're in need, is that they feel more secure in their own home. They don't want to be turned away. And your sense of self is so um, delicate, especially if you've got kids. If you're a mom with kids, you emotionally want to stay home for as long as you can because you feel like your safe space is at home, which is why it's so important to have preps in your own home is because you emotionally will do better in your own home than in someone else's. And the... Um, if, if diseases are a problem, somebody else might not let you into their home. And so it can be very worrying. Um, I know for myself personally, in order for me to go to somebody else's home, I would need to be in dire straits or like where my, like if my home was destroyed and all my preps were gone, I'd go to somebody else's home. But most of the people I know are not as um, ready as I am. And so I don't really have anywhere that I could go in this area I have some friends who are very skilled with what they're doing in their preps, but especially in the winter or with water, like they don't have a pump on their well. I don't, I don't personally know anybody in my area that I would feel would be prepared to take us the way that I'm prepared here, which is really kind of, ugh, that's, that's really worrying. That's, that's worrying to me is that, if I'm the only one that I know that actually grows their own food, has a wood stove, has a pump on their well, all these, if I'm the only person that has that, that's really weird to me. That's really, really weird with, um, with how delicate our particular area is as far as cold and drought and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I have some people who are amazing at growing food and they're amazing at um, what they do, but um, they would be uh, in a bad place if the power went down for very long. Camp Patton Family Compound said, oh, it tried to skip me down again and now I can't find it. Um, Apocalypse well pumps said they were deep well hand pumps. Thank you for sharing that. So it sounds like apocalypse well pumps are for deep wells. And I know that in the layman's catalog, they had some that went pretty deep. They're not as easy to pump as mine is just because you're bringing the water up from a really long way, but you could get water. Um, oh, where, where was it that I saw that? Oh, <laughs> Nad Nadav Villar, Forge and Woodcraft said those people will also get alerted when they show up that, that here there is lead. Yes, there's that too. And the nice thing is, is the earlier you get your kids started with that kind of thing, the more comfortable they are with it. Like I said, this, this last week, my kids went out and used their, they're just 22s, uh, their 10 22s on rock chucks and brought food in. They butchered the goats mostly by themselves. And um, if we needed to get firearms, firearms out for some reason, my kids would be comfortable with that and not a hazard and not emotional about it because they've been, they've been around guns since they were two. So yeah, I think it's also important that any, 
any child or human in your home understand gun safety. Cam Patton said, our wood stove only smokes when starting up. It's a nice design. Ours, because of the nature of our wood, everything here is pine. Um, when our wood is really dry, which we're working really hard this year that all our wood be dry, uh, we don't get a lot of smoke, but you can smell it. You can smell the pine burning. So even if you can't see the smoke, you can smell it. Um, but Camp Patton, what kind of stove do you have? I'm curious. We have the Elmira Flame View, Fire View, and uh, it is a, a cook stove, and so it's not as efficient as, as a normal, just little, little stove. It's not as efficient. American Eden said, how are your gardens, Julianne? My beets fried. Tomatoes and peppers are struggling. Potatoes are doing awesome. Yes, my potatoes are good this year. They're very happy. Um, everything has been doing fine. I planted them, I think, in mid-May, which is the normal time to plant. Usually I'll plant in April, but this, this year I just did mid-May uh, because I was using the rototiller instead of having it tilled by the tractor. I will never do that again. I will have the tractor till it because, yeah, yes. It takes at least half an hour to do one row and it is sweat work. It is so hard. It is so hard. Mm -hmm. So in the future, I would just have the tractor come and till it because it tills deep. Um, and it tills fast and, and then it's done and I can plant the whole garden. I only planted probably a third of the size of garden that I did last year because I wanted to experiment I wanted to experiment and see how well the mulch from last year would hold up. And so I just wrote to tilled the strips themselves that were the rows and exhausting, <laughs> frustrating. And the garden is not as far ahead. It, it should be four weeks further ahead than it is currently. It's doing fine. I've got greens planted out there. We have lots of peas. The beets are doing okay, but we water really, really deep once a week. And um, and and we have sunken beds because we live in, in the desert part of me. We've got, we've got cottonwood coming off trees today. Um, we've got deep sunk beds so that it holds the water right around the vegetables. We do not sprinkle. We do not do drip systems. We do uh, standing water in those beds. All right. Palmetto said, when I lived in suburbia, the power went out in winter. So I built a rocket stove from cinder blocks and sat in the crawl space, feeding it and trying to read a book. I think that's awesome. I think that kind of ingenuity gives you peace of mind. Yeah. Um, let's see. That's a great idea. Camp Patton said, build a generator quiet box to keep it from being heard from any distance. So, so yeah, if you have a generator, it can be heard. The other problem with the generator is that it requires fuel and it requires a lot of fuel. Um, when I was a kid, my dad had a gas tank, a big farm gas tank on the property so that if we were ever, um, in a situation where we couldn't, get gas. We had gas for the tractors. We had gas for the snowmobiles. We had gas for the vehicles if we needed them. And um, that was what my dad had was just a gas tank on the property that was not electrical. It was a hand crank. So we had a hand crank diesel and a hand crank gas. And, um, and yes, as a teenager, I would steal from it because I didn't want to go pay for gas. I, I wasn't stealing. I had to ask permission, but like, yeah, as a teenager, <laughs> it was like, I'm on fumes, dad. Uh, it wasn't always safe for emergencies, which is a good thing though, is because gas does not stay good forever. You do want to cycle through it. And so uh, dad would use it for the farm vehicles and that kind of thing. And occasionally as a teenager without any money, I would get to have some of that gas out of the gas tank too. But it had, it was the old hand crank one. It was not, it was not dependent on electricity to get fuel out. It was kind of cool. Um, American Eden said gravity fed water system. Yeah. So if you had like a, an above ground cistern, that's what, um, that's what Doug and Stacy do over at, um, off group with Doug and Stacy. It's gravity fed. Zelda said when we had the power outages, ice storms, our 20 kilowatt generator, two equals 500 gallon tank propane kept everything running. Our Christmas light's still on. We got knock on our door, local sheriff welfare check. I love it. Uh, uh, uh. 
Um, yeah, I don't know what propane is right now, but I know that for my parents to heat our home and, and keep the cook stove going and everything, uh, they spent a lot of money on propane. But if you're going to have propane, make sure that it's, if you're going to have something like natural gas or propane, I would pick propane. And that's because you can store it on your own property. You can buy or rent a tank and fill it up. And then it's on your property. It's not natural gas where it comes from somewhere else and magically appears in your pipes. You want a tank. You want something you can store on your property and pay for in advance. Hi, honey. Oh, she did. How many yeah. did she have? I don't know. I just saw oh. one next to her and she saw me and she's getting a little nervous. Okay. So I ran okay. Back here. So make sure to have water next to the water and food there in a shallow dish. It needs to be shallow dish and one of the little. Uh, sea trace. Yay! Well, I heard him talking. Bye -bye. I heard him talking. And okay. I just went out there and watched. Oh, that's and so I saw a little yellow. Yay! Oh, that makes my day. I was like, you heard that. She was dead. You got to see her. Like, okay. Well, she was over there in that original mess. Oh, that's so exciting. Oh, don't. Don't do that. Okay, he, we need to disconnect that because it's turning off my stuff. Okay, anyway, so we've had these geese for three years now, and she's never managed to hatch out babies, but it sounds like she did it this time. That is so exciting. Okay, so they need, is there already food up, up there? Um, yes, there is. Okay, so I need you to dig down deep and get the turkey starter and make sure it's not sand. Yeah. And fill one container up with turkey starter, and one, but don't carry it out in the tray because you'll break the tray. And stay away from mama. No, no, you're not worrying about the phone unless you want to be cut off from the phone today. That's very, very exciting. So once she comes out with them, what we're probably going to do is put her in the little coop where the ducklings are now. So Kaya, go help Paige and get the ducklings put in the backyard. And be super, super careful not to stress mama. She probably, she probably has new babies hatching even as we speak, so she cannot get off the nest. She's already off the nest. Fully? Yeah. She walked out. Is baby going with her? Yeah. Okay, nice. She was talking to Okay. All right, we're going to have to put her and baby, but listen, we don't do that until after there's food and water in the coop for her, right? Yep. Because otherwise the stress of it will make her crazy. Yep. So you don't move mama until you come ask me. Okay. Um, girls, actually, come here. Please come. Come. Put food and water next to food and water. That they can reach into. Uh -huh. Don't mess with the ducklings. It'll stress her out. We'll just keep everything exactly as it is okay. until tonight. Okay. You can push the no. No, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to just go get food and water next to the big water where she's going to take her bath. And you're going to leave the ducklings alone. Make sure, just make sure they have food and water. Don't go in there looking around for anything, okay? okay. All right. Sorry, guys. Uh, that's very exciting. Uh, why did it go so far up? My goodness. Cam Patton said, yes, in Idaho, if you are in a city town, you have to have agriculture well water rights, and the water is not supposed to be used for human use. Wow. It must be a North Idaho versus South Idaho thing. Very interesting. Um, or, yeah, I guess you said you're in city, so I wouldn't know about that. If you got agricultural property in the middle of city, I'm sh I'm, I'm sure you're right. It's, it's a different story. Um, <laughs> American Eden said, that is Andrea Blue. And that she changed the name of her channel. Oh, I must be way far away on on what my comment should be because Palmetto just said an RV isn't really camping, in my opinion. I I feel the same way. I feel like if you go out into nature, and you are living in something that has all the amenities from home, that's not really camping. It's it's there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not camping. Um, awesome. Barn raised by Jesse. Can you let the puppy in, honey? Yes, my daughter won first place at the county fair for her barbecue pulled groundhog a few years ago. Vegans are delicious. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so groundhog rock chuck is uh they're herbivores. They are 
we, we, I soaked them in salt water and vinegar overnight and you couldn't tell they were any kind of wild game. They, they tasted amazing. And they're, I had to pull a lot of the fat off. We didn't cook them with all the fat that they had because they've been eating all of our pasture ground, which is why we had to kill them in the first place. But, um, so barn raised by Jesse said a deep well hand pump is on my list as well as a rainwater collection system. Yeah. Janet said Zelda. Oh, sorry. Time and Zero is commenting about what's happening in the city, that people in the cities have lost touch with reality. I think that when you're too far away from nature and also if you are not in touch with what it takes to feed yourself and to get rid of your waste and to keep yourself clean. If you're really out of touch with how those things happen when there's no electricity, I think that um, I think that leads to some a sense of entitlement, a sense of where your ground zero is, when in reality your ground zero is down here. Like your, your actual basic needs are like way down here, but your sense of your basic needs is up here. Um, I think that can lead to a lot of stress because if you think this is your basic survival level, but really your basic survival level is down here, then if anything goes wrong up here, you feel like you're, you're wits end and you're, you're scared, not knowing you can come down here and still live quite comfortably and that you'll be okay. I think that gap between those two things leads to a lot of mental disorders and depression and, um, sadness because you don't feel safe and you're depending on your city for water you're depending on your city for heat you're depending on everything is so intertwined and it's such a big old spider web of need and codependency and like all that kind of thing that when you live in the city you feel like they should take care of you and you don't realize you can take care of yourself which i think is not a fun place to be because then people come in and manipulate you into voting for something maybe you don't believe in or into doing things that maybe you don't believe in because they hold all the keys to your survival. Um, here we go. Camp Patton said, for outdoor cooking, a 10 by 20 pop-up carport works great for a fire pit shelter. That's a fantastic idea. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, it, you know, it's kind of smoky and not, not maybe the most pleasant thing, but uh, it's better than having your fire get rained on. Use your no muscle. Oh, no. Does that mean like, like have boundaries? Is that what you mean by that? Kaya, go take the puppy out. You're not reading yet. Go play with the puppies. Um... Sea man of the woods, central U.S. said, "Learning how to camp, how to cook with campfires, and not dependent on store-bought charcoal is a good thing to teach your children on your camping trips. Enjoy your channel. Thank you. Yeah, I think Dutch oven cooking and doing it with real wood and having enough wood on hand to be able to do it is important. I like to be two or three years out on my firewood, and I like to have a, a pretty good mix of firewood. By having my wood storage out two or three years, what mean what that means is that as I see places that are taking down trees, I can go get a little bit of wood at a time. It doesn't have to be an overwhelming day of um, getting firewood, but even just getting one cord of firewood, uh, you know, a couple times throughout the year means that I stay ahead of that three year supply of firewood. And it means I don't have to wear myself out. I can get it when it's convenient. I can get small pieces that I can actually lift into the back of the truck. And I keep it simple that way. And so um, also when somebody local has a really good price on firewood and they're willing to deliver it, we'll buy it because it costs more to go out in the woods and cut it ourselves. And John can't do that kind of thing anymore because of his back. And as I age, it's harder for me. And so just a little bit of collection here and there. The other thing that I've done is I've planted firewood trees on my property. I have softwood trees because that's what wants to grow here. But I've also planted different types of oaks that will live on my property and um, black locust, which is a great firewood. It's a very dense wood. Um, all those things 
I have planted on my property so that if push came to shove and I had a year that I couldn't get firewood, I could cycle through all of my um, older trees if I needed to and, and then plant more. But even though we're only on an acre and a half, there's a whole lot you can do um, for self preservation. One thing we do is we put the pigs out by the cottonwoods and the pigs expose the roots of the cottonwoods and the poplars. And when the roots get exposed just a little bit, they will send up a shoot and that will turn into a new tree and your forest will start to spread without you having to plant anything. So we have quite a marching forest of cottonwood along the backside of our property uh, where we've kept pigs. And it's always extending because those little bits of roots are getting exposed and then it'll, it'll shoot up a it'll shoot up a new tree in that spot. So we have maybe 30 trees that we never planted just since we started keeping pigs in that area. Um, I do cover that with their old hay so that the roots don't stay exposed. I, I don't want to kill the, tr the trees that were there first. So we do deep mulch in those areas. As we feed the pigs, we move the hay into the spots where they've uncovered the roots. And then when the little root comes up, it has mulch around it so it's not drying out too much. And that is a system that we have figured out works really well. I wonder if I should go down like all the way and see what people are saying and then move that way. Um, Janet said, age, you look really young to me. I am 42. Okay, Janet, I like that statement. Codependence and politics equals socialism and communism. Yes, when you want everybody else to take care of you and you're not responsible for your own actions, it means you don't get to be responsible for any of your actions. <laughs> Somebody else will take away your responsibility. American Eden said, my friend burns black locusts, fresh cut. They burn well for her, but are hard on the chainsaw chains. Need a lot of sharpening or a chain or change out because chains dull quickly. Yes. That is what I've heard is that the black locust is really, really dense. Um, Zelda said, oh, she's talking to American. Hello, Ish. Ish Harton, is that how you say it? Ish Harton, I love this channel from the farm lady. Hi from India. I never make it here for live stream. I'm so glad you made it this time. This morning is really on my heart because I was not sleeping well last night. I'm so anxious about hay right now. I've got grain for the chickens and and grain for everything else. We've transitioned our rabbits away from pellets. They don't need pellets anymore. We feed them a little bit of wheat, a little bit of sunflower seed, and then hay, and that's their standard diet. And to that we add trees and and uh, garden stuff and weeds and stuff like that. But we have transitioned them all the way off of pellets. They, When we put pellets in the cage, they won't even eat them. And so they are, those are my free to make money, free to fill the uh, freezer babies right now is the rabbits. We've done the same thing with the pigs. Uh, with the milk goats, they, they drink milk or whey from cheese. They eat food scraps. Right now they're running through all of our old potatoes. The, the potatoes that have sprouted, we, we have boxes and boxes of them. We have already planted boxes and boxes of potatoes all over the property, but now we still have boxes and boxes. And people keep giving us boxes of sprouted potatoes. And so we're ripping the sprouts off. We're baking a whole oven full of potatoes at a time. And then we break those up and give those to the pigs. What we can't eat is like hash browns and stuff like that. Um, and so that's what we're doing with the pigs. So really the only thing we have to bring in right now is we need to make sure we have minerals for the animals, that we have some kind of grain that all the animals can eat, and then we need hay. The sunflower seeds are a blessing, but not essential. Um, and so right now me sitting here in a cold year where the, where the rain keeps coming in and maybe the hay's having a hard time drying out, I'm really stressed out about hay because I buy a year's worth of hay at a time. I don't buy just for the winter. I buy for one full year, because then if something happened and the pastures weren't good, or if it took me a little longer to get hay next year, I would have enough food for all of my animals, except the chickens, because they don't eat hay, but I can store them grain. Um, it makes me very anxious when I see my hay supply go down, and I can see that that's my prep, that I can't I can't get around the anxiety on that one because everything that feeds me needs hay. Um, let's see. Oh, that's a good one. Janet said, um, David the Good talks about how he ruined a whole garden with compost contaminated with Grazon. So I don't put 
compost on my garden. I'm trying really hard to figure out how to put my ducks and my rabbits in the garden, in the pathways, and it's prohibitively expensive. I'm still trying to figure it out, but I don't have the funds right now to put into materials to ex experiment with it and find a way to even maybe put sheep in the garden paths. Um, the most expensive thing I have right now for my animals is mulch, if that makes sense. Like I need to mulch the paths of my garden. I need to get bedding for my animals. I need to put more mulch down around my fruit trees and mulch is very expensive. If instead I can put as many animals as it can bear, then I don't have to buy mulch. The grass gets cut down and everything gets fertilized. I haven't figured it out, but it is so on my radar right now. I haven't. Um, but until, uh, here's the thing, when you're, when you're building a system that other people haven't built before, it costs money to, to, to figure out how to build it wrong, if that makes sense. I have built so many things the wrong way, and that's where you spend your money. Once you know how to build it the right way, it's not that ex expensive because you know which, which things to get. But for this one, if I've got a 5,000 square foot garden, <laughs> that is a lot of material. And they're going to crush most of the material the first time I build it or they'll get through it. And I just don't have the mental energy right now to watch them crush things while I'm trying to figure out the system. And so I just put it on the back burner. I want to figure it out, but I haven't figured it out yet. It could just because it would save a huge amount of money to be able to graze ducks or rabbits in your garden without them missing with the garden itself. Wow. No weeds in the garden, no weeds in the path. All you'd have to weed is just in the little tiny row that has all your food in it. It would save so much time. It would fertilize your garden so that next time you tilled it, it was already fertilized. You wouldn't have to bring in compost because your animal's been pooping on it all year. Um, yeah, I would love to be able to do something like that. And, and I would recommend sheep, ducks, and rabbits for it, honestly, because they're the ones that are the least um, aggressive about trying to go through through um, fences. Um, it, they're not physically aggressive against their cage, if that makes sense. Um, let's see. Vintage Living Homes that said, I'm having a lot of anxiety about a lot of things and trying to get everything done alone. I wish I had some help for some things. And, oh, she opened up the curtain in the back. I'll see if I can block that. Um, I hear that and I have help. I have two little girls that help me. My husband can't help me because of his back, but, um, I have two little girls that can help me, but here's the thing Does that help. Here's the thing about that is that there's a difference between growing your own food and prepping. And there's a difference between prepping and being a homemaker. And there's a difference between being a homemaker and being a farmer. All of these things, you have a separate hat and a separate number of things that have to be done in a day in order for you to get your primary job done. If you're trying to wear all of these hats at the same time, you're going to have anxiety and you're going to have stress and you're going to have sleepless nights. So um, you're only one person. Do, do your priorities first. Try to build your systems in a way that you don't have to touch them anymore. That's what I work really hard on. And we've done it for most of the animals. Most of the animals, we can do the chores once in the morning and they're done. And you don't have to think about them again unless you hear that they're distressed. If you hear a little baby goat crying, you always go out and check. If you hear a duck uh, quacking really, really loud, you go out and you check. But as far as like taking care of them, same thing for the gardens. Uh, I have automatic watering systems on all the hot beds, all the raised beds, so that it takes 15 minutes. I just turn the pump on, watch my clock 15 minutes, turn the pump off. Everything that is fresh eating in our hot beds gets watered at the same time. Um, the big garden in the front, one day a week, I go up and I water it, and it's done. I don't have to think about it. Which one is it? Uh, what are you doing? There's two of them. Oh, yeah, that's so fun. I hope they both make it. Um, as far as that goes, because, huh? Yay. Um, as far as all of this goes, if you don't set up your systems to take care of themselves when you're not there, you will drive yourself absolutely bonkers. Like when I add cheese making in, in the spring, uh, before that we were just straining the milk, putting it in the fridge. But once we add cheese in, 
I had to be really, really careful not to try adventurous things. I need to try very basic things and they need to be cheeses that can kind of take care of themselves when they're being made because I'm still taking care of gardens and I'm still making meals and I'm still having to do my get my videos ready for the week. And so when I add a new project and something that makes us more self-reliant and helps us be better preppers, I have to be very careful and guard my energy that I'm not trying to make something too fancy. Um, go ahead and shut the door. So um, in, in this lifestyle, in this lifestyle where you're growing most of your own food that, that would allow you to survive, maybe not your delicacies, maybe because I don't do anything that's a storage type of food. I grow everything fresh, which is why I have the hotbeds is because it can grow food year round and I don't have to store it. I don't have to can it. I don't have to dehydrate it because it's still growing out there in the hotbed in the greenhouse. Um, and also my animals are alive until they're in the freezer. And so they store themselves. I just have to feed them. And so my preps are very fresh oriented. I don't grow anything that has to be stored. Uh, we do fresh eating corn and then I will save some corn seed for seed, but not for eating. If we're going to have cornmeal or something like that, we buy it from the store. Same thing with dry beans. I don't do that. I don't, it's not in my radar at this point. What do you need, honey? Um, I don't want you doing that with his play stuff. It's his, it's his no, ball. It's my softball. Um, okay, but you're you're to talk to him first yes. before you buzz him, please. Um yeah. If I if I didn't have good systems set up. I wouldn't be prepping. I would be slogging through hardship. Um, and if I didn't have systems put in place, I wouldn't be homemaking. I would be uh, in drudgery in my kitchen. I have to have really good systems. Um, honey, why do you keep coming in and out? What's the matter? Um, actually, we need to keep in and out that time. Okay. Do you guys want to go through the garage instead? It is locked. Oh, why don't you go unlock it? That would be a good idea. Thanks, honey. Um, okay, Vintage Living has a good point. She says, family is always too busy and no one around me cares to do anything. So when I started doing what I do, I didn't have help. My, my husband is completely not interested in any kind of farming experience. He hates it. And so anytime that I required help, it turned into kind of a resentment, frustration thing between us. And so the deal that we made in the beginning was that anything that I wanted to do that was homesteading related, I had to find a way to pay for it and I had to be the one to do it. And so I, I had to start really small. I had to find a way to make money so that if I needed help, I could pay for somebody to help me. And it's okay that my husband felt that way. I think with this kind of thing, if it's on your heart, it's your responsibility to do it. And if you can't do it with a happy heart, then you shouldn't be doing it. And I have to remind myself of that every day. I have to remind myself to give my kids breaks when we're working. I have to go and do the chores for my kids once a week to say, this thing they're complaining about, can I find a solution for it? Um, I had to get bigger water feed, water troughs and bigger feeders and better fence because what was happening is we were losing animals because I was relying on people to take care of them that didn't care about whether or not they survived. And that's just, I mean, it didn't mean they were evil. It just meant that they were children. And I couldn't rely on my husband to be able to do things because it caused resentment. And so I, if I wanted it done, I had to either do it myself or find a way to make it easy for the people around me to do it and to motivate them somehow to do it. So I pay my kids for the work that they do uh, when we sell animals and, and that they've helped with. I give them money from that. When, um, when they do work for me and they do it well, they're rewarded with activities in town that I will take them to. And a lot of it they don't get paid for because they are eating on our home and I am the mom and I am in charge. But I try really hard not to have it be drudgery and to have special things involved with the work that they do on the property. And again, I've had to find ways 
to make the animals pay for themselves. And I did the YouTubing because I needed to find a way to pay for supplies to be able to homestead. It was my value system, so I needed to take it on myself. And, um, and, and with that, I have had to be very, very careful not to be codependent in what I'm willing to take on. That if my husband suddenly says he wants pork, I have to take a step back and say, well, do I want to grow pork? Because my husband doesn't help with the farming. And so if something is important to him, he needs to either buy it or, or take care of it here on the homestead. And there is that divide. You must still have a boundary of, well, it would be so nice if I could grow this for this person. It would be so nice if I could grow this for this person. But you have to stop doing that. If you're the one responsible for it and you're the one whose money is going into it, you need to set a boundary and say, well, if you want this on our homestead, if you want this on our home, if you want this on our property, you need to do the work, provide the money, just like I'm providing the money for the things that I think are important. And there really needs to be good dialogue there. There can't be any kind of whining or resentment or um, demanding because uh, God has his own plan for this person, and his own plan for you. And if you put it on your heart, you're the one who's responsible for it. Um, Camp Patton said, my daughter's rabbits are escape artists. They have made it from her cages on the big property across the street to my new place. Yes, it happens. My favorite, uh, my favorite cages are from Hostel Hare. They're fantastic cages. And at this point in time, I do not keep my rabbits in runs. I, I'm working on a run currently. But it is Fort Knox. I'm using a Gabion system so that not only are there four sets of wire, two sets of wire on each side, and then rocks in the middle, it also has wire in the bottom. But everything about it is Fort Knox, and it's it's layer upon layer upon layer of prevention. And I'm not confident in it yet, enough in it yet, to actually put the rabbits in it, if that says anything. I'm, I'm trying really hard to figure it out, but it, it's it. I'm not willing to. Um, I'm not willing to set the scourge of rabbits on my neighbors, and so I, I I'm having to reinforce it even more. Again, materials for that kind of thing are very expensive, and because um, you're using metal, and metal, any kind of metal mesh or anything like that is very expensive right now. And so the the magic squares that I really like to use that I think would be perfect for this. Um, I can't afford to buy them. I've, it, it costs $200 for a package of, I think, was it 90 squares, something like that. And those squares get used up really quickly. So I just don't feel like in the, in the system of priorities that I have, if I'm going to spend that kind of money on something, I have to know that money is going to come back again very quickly, that it's not just going to sit there, um, um, being used by something that does not have a quick turnover. If I'm going to spend that kind of money, it's got to be fast turnover. So, um, yeah, Lori said the cottonwood is horrible so soon. Yeah, the cottonwood has really been super fun. Um, in Idaho Falls, it was really bad. Yeah, Christy said, better to address things up front and not let a root of bitterness grow up. I'm trying to learn that. I think we learn that every day. I have to learn it every day. I have times when I'm like, oh my gosh, this is benefiting the whole family. Why can't everybody just get behind me on this and everybody push together? And I have to really check myself on that. Like, well, what have they already been doing today? Well, my husband's been at work and now he's home and I'm expecting him to like heave ho and help me get this massive project done um, that's, that he doesn't necessarily have an interest in. And that maybe isn't a beneficial thing. A lot of times if you're not getting help from your family, it's because the project doesn't actually bring enough benefit back to your family to um, justify the money and time that's going into it. And that's a really good indicator. It's a fantastic indicator. If your whole family feels resentment towards your homesteading project, you may be homesteading wrong. You may be growing the wrong things. You may be uh, doing things the hard way in such a hard way that you really need, it, may, it could be a blessing from God. Can I just say that? A lot of times when my projects have been a huge no from the universe, all I need to do was just switch myself a little bit this way and try it, do a little more research. And I found a way that I could do it by myself without resentment because I enjoyed it. And then my family would see that I enjoyed it and they'd come out and they'd start helping me because the big no from the universe was a big no. It was like, I'm making my family mad. I don't have the resources for it. 
And I find that if I'll back off at that point and reassess the situation and say, well, why do I feel like this is so important? Maybe it's not important. Maybe I should listen to my family and, and reassess the situation. And almost always that's what it is, is that I, <laughs> there were other opportunities here I could have taken advantage of that would have benefited us more. Um, I think prepping is one of those things. I think you fill up your storehouse, your, your pantry, your medicine cabinet first, and then you start working on homestead stuff as you can afford it. Don't put it on a credit card. Uh, don't put your cart before, is it the cart before the horse? Don't put the cart before the horse type situations. Make sure you have food storage in your home before you start worrying about, you know, all the outside stuff. Um... Okay, Zelda said, we don't want to rely eating on animals as we're counseled. They'll be full of diseases towards end of time. We're seeing that now. Salmonella getting much worse. We believe if we are faithful and share. I like that. I, I, I would be probably in some trouble if that was the case. I've tried to be vegetarian before and uh, my teeth started to disintegrate and um, my mental health was <laughs> really bad. Um, I, I'm, I don't disbelieve that. I, I don't disbelieve that it's good for us to eat vegetables and, and that kind of thing. And I know for my own personal health, the reason I grow my own meat is because I require it to function in any way. But if, if indeed we were supposed to be vegetarian, I think we would be given the ability to do that. I think if God wants us to go and be fully vegetarian, uh, that that way will be made open. Honey? Can you stop coming through that door because the light does weird things? If you can go through the basin in the garage instead. Thank you. Um, Janet said pallets and junkyards are helpful. Yes, very helpful. Um, having a truck and a trailer is very helpful because then, yes, you can get firewood, you can get lumber, you can get all sorts of um, thrown away objects that you can still use. Uh, we don't have a, a trailer anymore, and um, J John likes to keep his camping stuff in the truck, so we can't use that. So mostly, mostly I just hire people to bring stuff in uh, and bring it in in quantity, and that's what works for me currently. Um, and again, that's why it was really nice that in the beginning, John said, make your own money to do the homestead because I can't, he couldn't support the family on the homestead because homesteading can be very expensive. And, um, and so it was actually a blessing when John put down a boundary and said, you can't use family money for the homesteading because it's taking food out of the family's actual mouth to, to try and grow this food. And, um, it taught me to be more self-reliant and to be more deliberate about which projects I choose and just to work harder and, and work smarter. Uh, Zelda said, get out of debt. Don't buy new. Teach kids to do the same. Don't get me wrong. I'm allergic to wheat corn. I love a good tri-tip smoked on my Traeger. Um, yeah, for, for me, I used, everything I used to get was all secondhand and, and uh, repurposed. And most of what we've done here has been secondhand and repurposed. And as I get older, I really struggle to use secondhand and repurposed. One reason is, is that I have found things that really, really work well that are new. <laughs> like those magic squares. Oh my gosh, that works so good. The other thing is things like cow panels and hog panels. If I could get them secondhand, I totally would. And when I go to the store and I buy panels, I ask them if they have seconds, which is the bent ones. I ask for the bent ones specifically and they're 50% off. And so I get as many seconds as I possibly can, but I have them delivered with the new stuff I just bought. I don't go out and pick it up. I try and I just... I, uh, once I turned 40, it really took it out of me to go out and try to scavenge very much. It, it really made it hard. And for the $20 delivery fee from somewhere I'm already buying something, it works really well. For instance, a pallet guy down the road. I can go and the first time I bought from him, it was $5 a pallet for really nice pallets. Now it's $7 a pallet for really nice pallets. But having him deliver 60 at a time meant that I don't need pallets for a couple of years. And as the prices go up, it won't affect me. I'll be able to build as many hotbeds and and wood um, retention uh, shelters and uh, hay storage areas as I need to with my pallets now. 
and he didn't charge me for delivery because it was only a mile and a half down the road. And so it made so much more sense for me to have him get all these matching, beautiful pallets, deliver them to my house and unload them than it did for me to go try to scavenge in a dump in, in a junkyard and have pallets that didn't fit each other that I couldn't use. It, w- it w- would be one thing in my 20s and 30s. I totally did that all the time in 20s and 30s. Not in my 40s. Um, so, hey, Jana, is this a church group or something? No, nope, not a church group. This is just a, a gardening channel. Um, I like that. Good Times Homestead with Jen and Steve said, I've been taking my garbage and recycling to the county recycling center instead of having them pick up on the highway. So now they let me take pallets and things they have lying around. I like that. If you're already there and you've got a trailer, pick things up for sure. Um, Yeah. All right. So I feel like maybe I've said enough. (laughs) JF said, thank you for sharing the family struggles. We have that going on here. Also, you've given me a different way of looking at things and thank you. Um, Yeah. Again, I'm going through a codependence. It's kind of like an AA meeting. People who've had addiction in their families, a lot of times compensate for things and don't communicate well when they uh, need to say no or when they have needs. And so that's something that I struggle on every day is wanting to take care of people, having it built into me to take care of people. Um, And yet having that not be healthy for them or me. And a homestead can be that in a really big way. Uh, Prepping can be that in a really big way. You don't want to see people suffer. You want to make sure everybody has enough food and you want to facilitate, facilitate, facilitate. And you have to step back and not facilitate. You have to say, what has got put on my heart? What can I do? And then can I do it without resentment? It's a big deal. And again, I work on it every single day. Um, American Eden said, oh, wow, I want to see your new rabbit run. I know. I want to see my new rabbit run, too. Uh, it's just been on the back of my priority list this year. I, um, I had a kid in school this year where I haven't had that happen before. And one of my pairs of hands wasn't here. And so a lot of the big projects I started earlier in the year are just not getting done. And it has to be okay. It has to be one of those things where I look at all the good, bad, good, better, and best. And I have to pick best. I have to let better and good kind of fall to the wayside this year. And the nice thing is, is God took care of things anyway, even though I'm not out there to touch everything. God has figured everything out. We've had rain when we needed rain. The irrigation system is working. Uh, We sold a lot of the animals that I looked at and just thought, I don't have room in my freezer. I can't wait any longer to butcher these animals uh, because they're eating too much feed. And so I just need to sell them, which is not like me. Usually I don't sell animals. I put them in the freezer, but we have no more room. And the things that we do have in the freezer are starting to get frostbit because we are not getting through it fast enough. So the better part of Valor was instead of preparing for a doomy, gloomy future in which I'd need these ducks, instead I just sold them. And I have a boar again that I need to get sold because I already have a boar. And um, we've been eating and putting in the freezer what we can quicker. So we don't have as many mouths to feed. And I am praying with all the intensity of my heart that I could get some hay, some good hay, have a year's worth and have it paid for and not have to worry about it anymore. But there's no such thing as a certain anything. And, you know, a fire, a flood, the hay could be taken out. And that doesn't mean God doesn't love me. It just means sometimes uh, the best laid plans of mice and men. Is that how they say it? You just do your best. You can't, you can't, you have to assume God's going to take care of you. And do what he puts in front of you. So anyway, I better go. I got to go get some greens harvested out of the greenhouse and fed to the pigs really really. Jeanette Chambers said maybe a new freezer. So here's the thing about homesteading. Once you get really good at it is don't buy a new freezer. <laughs> Even though you have all these animals that you can put in the freezer, don't. Because you can only eat the food so fast. We had three freezers. Last year we had three freezers and I just kept putting food into it and I kept putting food into it and I kept putting food into it. And you know what happens? Everything at the bottom doesn't get eaten. It gets a freezer bit and then 
what do you do? Cook it up for the dog. And so really it's another one of those things of rein things in. Don't have more things, more animals, more production than what your family and your farm actually needs. That's a big problem for me is that once you get really efficient with this stuff and you've got it going, you need to remember to let your farm make money for you by selling things once your own freezer is full, which is what we had to do with pigs, goats, sheep, and rabbits this year. Oh, and ducks and chickens. Oh my gosh, so many things. I have full freezers. I actually had, I actually sold one of my freezers because I saw this was a problem that I was putting food in the freezer and we weren't eating it fast enough. So we're down to two freezers. We have a really, really big freezer and then we have a small freezer and they're both absolutely full to the max. Plus we have pork out in the smokehouse. Uh, oh no, we have more. We, okay. So previously we had four freezers. Now we're down to three freezers. Uh, the freezer up here, the big freezer downstairs, and then a smaller freezer next to it. And um, so I, I sold my fourth freezer. I sold my fourth freezer so that now we only have three. And um, once you get into this and your animals are really efficient and you've taken them off commercial feed and they're just eating scraps in the house and scraps out of the garden and stuff like that, it can be really, really tempting to let their numbers creep up because you're like, oh, they're not costing me anything to feed. I, I should let the numbers creep up. And you can't afford to do that because you don't have anywhere to put it and you can't eat it that fast. You just can't do it. Um, yeah, Zelda said chickens love freezer stuff. So with, with the amount of energy that I put into things, I'm very, very picky about letting. So most of what's in my freezer is meat because we have the gardens and the greenhouses that grow our green food. I don't freeze any of my garden stuff because I don't need to. The hotbed greenhouse will grow food all year round, so I don't need to put vegetables in the freezer. I also don't can. I can very little um, because our bellies prefer fresh food. We, we don't do real well with canned food. Um so I can very, very little. I dehydrate a little bit more than I can. But most of what we eat is fresh. We eat fresh from our animals. I, um, I eat fresh from the garden. We eat fresh from the fruit trees. We eat fresh the cheese and the milk from the goats. Everything I try to keep everything fresh and rotated. The freezer is my issue. Is that when I get ahead of myself and raise too many animals, but too many animals in the freezer, we can't keep up with the meat. So actually, I really need to get rid of one more freezer because um, it would force me to liquidate some of my livestock and cut the numbers down until we were rotating through it every six months. At this point, we're re we're rotating through it every eighteen months, and that's not fast enough. Um. Yeah, Janet said, I love my dogs and they will eat dog food and then eggs, chicken and rabbit in an emergency. Yeah. And so our dogs and our cats get uh, bones and scraps from when we butcher. And then when we have meat that's in the house that has been cooked, that um, has been in the freezer, a little, or fridge a little bit too long, we'll feed it to the dogs, we'll feed it to the cats and they do really well with it. But um, like our chickens are free range. They don't eat very much grain. Uh, they eat slugs, they eat bugs. They don't really need food out of the freezer. And so the amount of effort that I'm putting into getting this meat into the freezer is too high for me to then want to feed the chickens or anything else purposefully that meat. So what I really need to do is instead take my effort down. And the way that I take my effort down, that would take some of my anxiety down, that would mean I don't have to buy as much hay, that would mean I don't have to buy as much grain is cut back on the animals. I keep breeders, I keep extra breeders, but I don't need to keep extra, extra breeders, if that makes sense. I don't need to keep so many backups that I'm feeding and having to take care of because then it creates resentment in my kids having to take care of too many animals. Because for instance, we don't have room to put a pork in for another year. I, don't, I do not have room for another pork. And yet I have breeding stock. So what I did this year is the minute that my babies were able to be weaned, I sold them. And I sold them so that the pigs... Um, cost zero this year. I had to buy feed for them in the winter. It was very minimal because uh, I had a lot of pigs. I had like 12 pigs in the middle of the year and it didn't cost very much to feed them, but it was way more than what we could eat. Way more than, um, way more than we could eat. And all the sows were pregnant. So I sold two pregnant sows. I sold one boar, two boars. I sold two boars. Um, I sold an experimental sow that, um, I didn't like her as well as my other. So I sold them all very, very quickly. 
and and now I have one sow, one sow, one little gilt, and two boars. It'd be nice to keep the extra boar, but I'm seeing that uh, once again, why do I need him? <laughs> I don't. I don't need him. Um, American Eden said, I'm so happy I'm, I'm, I'm acquiring pals to do the hotbed greenhouse, looking forward to gardening during the off season. Yes, yes, yes. Zelda said, yes, pumpkin sweet potatoes are great for dogs and cats. Um, I haven't tried that yet. Uh, we have moved our, our dogs to a grain free, uh, carbohydrate free diet and they eat less. They seem pretty happy. Um, they get lots of bones from our property. But I haven't tried pumpkins and sweet potatoes. I, I'll see what they think of it when it's mixed. Okay, Luba said, have you tried to make cured sausage with excess meat? So I do cured um, ham and bacon at this point. Uh, John has done uh, a fresh sausage. We have not tried to do a cured sausage yet, but that is probably what we'll do with the next pig. Um, I'm excited to try that. But it's just one of those projects that a lot of times after we butcher a pig, we're kind of tired. And so instead of sitting and looking and being like, oh, let's start another project, a lot of times we're just like, oh, I don't ever want to look at a pig ever again. So if we wait late enough in the year, like in December to butcher, if we wait till December and then let it just hang in the smokehouse and we don't worry about curing it immediately, if we give it a day or two, a lot of times we've recovered and then we don't mind taking the chilled meat out of the smokehouse. But I do think that if you're going to do something like that, something cured, it is very helpful just to do it when you butcher, close to the time you butcher, because then all the mess is contained at one time. And we always have a lot of fresh pork. And so it would, what do you need, pretty girl? Do you need to go outside? Um, is something with her to let her out? Or, or out in the front. You can let her out in the front. I just think maybe she needs to go potty. Um. Christy said, I'm going somewhat off grid. I will have to eat fresh or can. I haven't really learned salt preserving or smoking. Um, that no, that's fine. Thanks. Honey. But I don't really want the flies. How about if you close that and she can rest or she can go in the front. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you live in a really cold climate in the winter, it's fantastic to learn how to salt here. Um, if you don't live somewhere that gets really cold in winter, it might be a little trickier. You you have to really, really get that salt on and get the smoke on and really get it cured and so that it is resilient to pests. In our area, we do it in the winter, and so it's not a big deal. No flies. Mm -hmm. Hey, Spring Meadow. Um, okay, Zelda said, I make a lot of sauerkraut. My chihuahua, Otis, and cats love sauerkraut. I posted videos of them eating sauerkraut. It's great for our guts. I do like sauerkraut. My mom makes a lot of that kind of thing. Um, Chrissy said, sweet potatoes are a complex carbohydrate. I was able to give those to my diabetic mom. And as long as we grow them in a hotbed, we can grow sweet potatoes here. Can't grow them in the ground. It's just not a long enough season. Woman of the Spirit said, I have two breeding pairs of rabbits. I breed them twice a year, sell the babies, which pays for their food for the full year. I have them to learn more about animal husbandry. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, Lubas said, look up how to make Italian soap rosada. It is easy and great. We will have to do that. Um, yeah, we could just butcher the, the The problem is with pigs or anything else, you really, even with a smokehouse, you can't butcher in the summer and expect the meat not to get contaminated with bugs. So um, that's one thing right now, we could butcher the boar, but then we would have to get on it and process it very, very quickly. Um, whereas if we do it in the end of November, beginning of December, we don't have to process anything quickly. Uh, we, can, we can take a couple days and uh, not have to worry at all about insects. So there is a time and a place for everything if you want it to be easy. Big animal butchery in the middle of summer is not a good idea. Um, Lori said, I'm starting, I'm looking to start goats and other animals. Just got my second set of chickens. How fun. Oh, uh, gotcha. Yeah, American Eden said, I'm glad it's not too late to plant sweet potato slips. Mine have just grown so much this last week wanting to plant them. It's going to be hot. I don't know if it's too harsh to plant new slips. 
we have had a few hours here and there of really bright sunshine. And so what we've done is anything that we're putting in, we put a bed sheet over it with, you know, we put a cage over it, put a bed sheet and then clip it with um, uh, clothespins and that keeps them shaded enough. I do have a shade cloth over the top of the hotbed greenhouse right now. And um, just that good venting, all that kind of thing. Um, let's see. Lori Carter said, do I sell meat? I cannot legally sell meat. I sell animals and then people can take those animals to the butcher if they want. But I don't take responsibility for, for butchering somebody else's meat. I can have people in my home and I can serve them meat or I can give them meat as a gift, but I can't butcher it for them and then sell it. Bye, Zelda. <laughs> Thanks, Lou Boss. Yeah, Christy said, I had to cut back on meat because of finances and I don't feel well without enough protein. That's something I struggle with too. So, and for us, it's not necessarily um, that I don't have the meat. It's that sometimes I just feel lazy and I don't cook the meat. So I'm trying really hard to find balance between what needs to happen in the house, what needs to happen outside, what needs to happen with the kids. And it can all be very overwhelming. Um, Paige, you're right behind the camera and it keeps trying to track you. Um Did I say I feel lazy? Maybe somebody else. When did I say that? Uh, um, sometimes you feel lazy and you don't want to. Oh, I do. I feel lazy. And I don't want to do, I, I just don't want to come in. I, I, I would rather be outside working than be in the house. And it's a real struggle for me as a mom because if I don't come in and scrub things, they don't get scrubbed. If I have the kids come in and clean things, it, it's barely, it's not really clean. It's not clean. And so if I don't come in and clean the kitchen doesn't get clean and then things don't stay hygienic, but I don't like to be in the house very much. <laughs> it's not, it's not really my happy place is the house. Um, yeah. Vintage living homes has said I need to eat meat too. When I don't cook I it, I crave that protein a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. And I'm grateful to have as much as I have. And at the same time, even, I mean, even when you have a glut, sometimes it gets boring cooking the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, Jeanette said, I also have quail and they're yummy, but fiddly to raise. Yeah, they can be, huh? <laughs> okay. I'm going to go take care of kiddos and get the kitchen clean. So if you're interested in the hundred dollar hotbed greenhouse, it should be in the description below. It is basic. It's meant to show you what's needed for it to be structurally uh, sound, but you can use a lot of different materials than what I used. And it's, it's, it's the first edition of the book. I am working really hard to get a bigger one put together, a bigger hotbed greenhouse, and also use a, uh, materials that people would have on hand or be able to purchase easily rather than random things, which is how I put it together last time. So I'll try to get another book out once I have it done. And once it looks more professional this time, I really wanted to be able to build it for less than a hundred dollars and show you guys that it could be done. And so that's how I did it. So it's on my Etsy store link should be in the description. And um, thanks for popping in and we will talk to you later.